Las Vegas, Nevada. A millionaire casino boss is found dead. His girlfriend and her lover are charged with murder. Did she do it or didn't she? It was the most trying time I've ever had in my life. It's a story that really has everything. I mean, sex, drugs, no, drugs love, betrayal, buried treasure. And it's all in the backdrop of Las Vegas. Was it suicide, an accidental overdose, or ruthless murder that took the life of a Las Vegas casino boss? Here's what happened. You decide. On September 17, 1998, rescue workers respond to a frantic 911 call from the home of a Las Vegas legend. Please send someone here. Please, can you do something? My husband's gone. He's, he's not breathing. I have to go. He needs me. The 911 operator traces the call to 2408 Palomino Lane a sprawling Las Vegas mansion. Inside, a grisly sight. Millionaire casino boss Ted Binion, dead. Crime scene investigator Mike Perkins was among the first at the scene. Obviously, there was no blatant trauma to the body of Mr. Binion. There, he, there wasn't a gunshot wound to the head. His throat hadn't been slashed. Uh, there wasn't anything substantial like that. There were a few small uh, injuries on his body. Uh, but we didn't have anything else specifically on him to go with. The woman who called 911 is not Ted Binion's wife. It's his girlfriend, 26-year-old Sandy Murphy. This is her first TV interview since being released after four and a half years in a federal penitentiary. Well, I came home and I parked in the Sally Port. And I came in through the side door into the kitchen and I said, Teddy Ruxpin, I'm home. I used to call him Teddy Ruxpin because I had a teddy bear when I was a kid. He didn't answer. So I went to the den to get him, and he was resting, of what appeared to be resting. And I tried to wake him up, and he wouldn't wake up. It was at that point I realized that he was in real trouble. Sandy fears the worst. She calls 911, and when police arrive, she tells them her story. Ted Binion has had a destructive addiction to heroin for almost two decades. His favorite way of getting high is smoking it, called chasing the dragon. To help him come down, he used a prescription sedative called Xanax. Dr. Enrique Lacayo was Ted Binion's neighbor. He prescribed the sedative to Binion the day before he died. I felt that it was medically necessary for him to have it to help him to go through the withdrawal without having to go back to the drug. A heroin addicts, they have a tendency to crave it as soon as they, they get off the drug. So I felt by him having the Xanax, he would feel much better to fight the addiction again. CSI Perkins finds an empty Xanax bottle and heroin paraphernalia. Everything about the scene suggests an addict on a deadly binge. Whether accident or suicide, police conclude that drugs killed Ted Binion. Case closed.
There are many who believe Ted Binion had good reason to take his life. Binion's heroin addiction cost him control of Binion's Horseshoe Casino, a Las Vegas fixture since the early days of Sin City. Jeff German is a Vegas journalist. Well, I mean, it, it, anybody who wants to talk about the Binions has to start with Benny Binion. He is the patriarch of the family. He died in 1989. He is one of the pioneers of Las Vegas. He's an old-time gambler uh, from Texas, ran illegal gambling operations in Dallas, and uh, one of the most colorful figures uh, this city has ever seen. He killed a few people in Dallas. He had to get out of Dallas and ultimately ended up starting the Horseshoe Club, which became one of the most uh, popular casinos of its time. Benny turned the Horseshoe into Vegas's most popular poker joint. He promoted the now legendary World Series of Poker. When Benny died, Ted and the family took charge of the casino. But Ted's problem with heroin haunted him. In 1997, the Nevada Gaming Commission revoked his license. His final words to the commission revealed his despair. This is my life. I have nowhere else to go. All he has left is Sandy. In the beginning, it was wonderful. I mean, I had started a new relationship, and he moved me into his home. And he had some troubles of his own with the gaming control board, and he was going through a divorce. So it was a little tough, but it was new, and we were in love, and we had a great time for, I would say, at least the first 12 months of our relationship. It was all bliss and everything that comes with love. Thanks to those. But the heroin was more powerful than love. John Mamet is a defense attorney in Vegas. He was a friend of Binion's. He loved his heroin more than he loved her. And that's what stepped in between Sandy and Teddy. You know, people say, well, he's been taking heroin for years, so he knows what he's doing. That's a joke. That's ridiculous. He, he is addicted to heroin for 15, 20 years. And because of that, when you start taking it, you don't realize your limits. And then you start taking Xanax on top of it. You don't know where you're at. CSI Mike Perkins concludes his investigation and finds nothing suspicious. The police are certain Ted Binion died of a drug overdose. When we left the residence on September 17th, we had not formed any definitive conclusions on what had happened to Mr. Binion. We obviously didn't have any signs of, of a substantial struggle or of a violent death. I'll call you when he's feeling better. Thank you. Bye-bye now. New evidence will produce a different version of events, one that points to murder. One day after casino boss Ted Binion is found dead, an autopsy determines the cause of death, a textbook overdose. Famed pathologist Dr. Cyril Wecht has reviewed the autopsy report. In my opinion, Ted Binion clearly, unquestionably died as a result of combined drug toxicity, heroin, <clears throat> and Xanax, a touch of Valium, but it was the heroin and the Xanax. Keep in mind that both are central nervous system depressants. Uh, heroin is a powerful analgesic, and Xanax a, a kind of a tranquilizer, and so on. Both work pharmacologically by depressing the different parts of the brain. And in combination, they produce a situation which we call synergism, uh, where uh, two plus two may equal five or seven, not just four. The body shows no signs of struggle. The pathologist notes a small red mark in the middle of Binion's chest and a mild abrasion on his upper lip. Neither points to foul play. 
Rigor mortis has set in, providing an approximate time of death around 12 noon or four hours before Sandy Murphy called 911. Vegas police officially closed the case. But the Binion family believes Sandy Murphy murdered Ted Binion. They hire a private investigator to prove it. To this day, Sandy says the cards were stacked against her. I think it's a very tough thing when you're up against a very powerful family who has a tremendous amount of political influence and I was sort of the scapegoat. The PI produces a new version of the facts. The story begins at a Las Vegas strip club when Teddy first laid eyes on Sandy, a 23-year-old California surfer girl. By most accounts, she danced topless for him, but to this day, Sandy Murphy says she was never a stripper. Well, I was very young, and I was traveling at the time, and it was my first time to Nevada. I was quite excited, and I lost money gambling, and had a girlfriend with me who was manufactured intimates, and um, we went to a gentleman's club. It was the first time I ever been to a gentleman's club, and we sold costumes, and that's how I met Teddy. Whatever the truth is, Ted Binion saw Sandy Murphy and was entranced. My Teddy Ruxpin. Yeah. <laughs> At first, I didn't really like him very much. He seemed sort of arrogant. And he was with a friend of his who um, I thought was rather interesting. And I didn't care for him in the beginning. But through several cocktails and hours later, he kind of won me over. And he was very silly and extremely witty and very intelligent. And I gave him my number, and he never stopped calling. <laughs> I love you. He divorced his wife of 25 years. Sandy moved in. Teddy was a man who swept me off my feet. I thought he'd fill the hole in my heart. I thought he'd love and protect me forever. Sandy was taken care of very well by Teddy. He gave her a uh, credit card with a 10,000 uh, limit, which he paid off every, every month. She had access to all the cash she needed. They lived in a, a million dollar home, beautiful ranch style home. He bought her a, a Mercedes sports coupe. They dined at expensive gourmet restaurants all the time. So it, it was a pretty good lifestyle for her. But by 1998, the relationship between Ted and Sandy was no longer the loving, gentle partnership it had once been. Well, I don't think anyone really knows what it's like to live with a drug addict. It's very difficult because it's like living with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. One day he would be the sweet, loving man that I know. And while at his highest moment, or at his lowest of lows, where he was looking to get high again, he wasn't that man anymore. Tom Loveday was Ted Binion's gardener for 15 years. The only thing I didn't like about Ted, that if he got stoned, or if he did his heroin, or if he got drunk, he got mean. And he got me only with his women. And he beat up Sandy, because I used to see the bruises on Sandy. He'd call me in the house when I came that following Thursday and say, Tom, I did a bad thing last night. I beat up Sandy. Teddy was the kind of guy who had this smile. No matter what he did or how angry you got at him. All he had to do was smile. I miss his face. I miss his voice. I miss his touch. Always a paranoid man, Ted wires his house with cameras. He watches Sandy's every move and he doesn't trust her. 
In this version of events, Sandy senses Ted is about to kick her out. She'll lose her car, her credit card, and the million dollar house which Ted has given her in his will. Some say Ted Binion was finished with Sandy Murphy. Hey, my TV back spin. What's wrong? You've been drinking again. Oh, where the hell have you been? Excuse me? Where the hell have you been? What business is it of yours? Oh, well, darling, if it's none of my business, why don't you get the hell out of here? Fine, I'm gone. Is this motive for murder? The private investigator takes a fresh look at Sandy's behavior the day Ted Binion died. He re-examines the statement she gave police at the hospital. My neighbor, he's a, he's a doctor and uh, He, he used to give us that stuff all the time when we were, uh, and I told him not to give him that stuff again. He gave him, he gave him some last night. Sandy's story comes across as a too perfect performance. Oh God, oh God, you wake up. CSI Mike Perkins doesn't buy it. I've been in the last 20 years with several police departments, over 6,000, close to 6,300 crime scenes, and Miss Murphy's behavior that day struck me as, as uh, fabricated. It just, it, it was varying too much. She seemed to be able to turn it off at will. Then there's the 911 call. Binion has been dead for about four hours at the time of her call. It's a strange statement. Ted's not only stopped breathing, he's stone cold. Sandy Murphy is either a grief-stricken girlfriend or a gifted actor. Another strange fact. At 12 noon, a realtor working on a deal for Ted phones the house. It's Barbara. Is Ted there? No, Barbara. Um, he's out of it. What's wrong? Are you okay? No. No one understands what it's like living with a drug addict. I've got this mess to clean up in the bathroom. Do you want me to come over? I could do that right now. No. He doesn't like people to see him like this. Oh, we have an appointment tomorrow at 1 p.m.? Well, you better call to see if you can make that appointment. Why don't you get me to come over there and we can go out to lunch and chat? No. Every time I go out, he interrogates me. Are you sure? Look, Barbara, uh, I have to go, okay? Goodbye. Ted Binion is already dead or lies dying at this very moment. An hour later, Sandy goes out to run some errands. Either she didn't see Ted on her way out, or she had something to do with his death. Well, I don't know that I remember all of my day, but I remember most of it only because I've told the story so many times before. And I remember specifically getting up at a certain point and feeding the dogs and having a chat about life and heroin and his life in hopes of having a life without heroin. The day before he died, Ted Binion calls his lawyer with strict orders. Yeah, take Sandy out of the will. She doesn't kill me tonight. Yeah. If I'm dead, You'll know what happened. Yeah.
Is money enough of a motive for Sandy Murphy to kill Ted Binion? There's another shocking discovery. Sandy Murphy has a lover, and he too has a motive for murder. Six months before his death, Ted Binion meets 33-year-old entrepreneur Rick Tabish in a men's room. Heard about this new guy hustling around Vegas. His name was Rick Tabish from Montana. I had a ranch in Montana. Hell, some of the best times of my life were in Montana. Anyway, Sandy and I were at the restaurant there having a couple of drinks and a steak. I excused myself to go to the John. Well, hell, there's Rick Tabish. Said I heard about him. Asked him if he'd like to come out on the town with Sandy and me. Yeah. He was a little hesitant at first, but I said, you don't know who I am, do you? My name is Ted Binion. You came. We met in the camp. We just hit it off. After a couple months, he consulted me about his problems, how he liked to quit taking drugs. I started helping the guy out. Everybody's against him. I just took him for who he was. It was good. Tabish owns a large trucking company. Binion asks Tabish for a bizarre favor. He enlists him to bury $5 million worth of rare silver coins. He directs Tabish to a vacant lot he owns in a small town outside Vegas. The paranoid casino boss explains that he doesn't want the coins falling into the wrong hands. Ted said, you keep the combo. You're the silver guy. If I need anything, we'll both come out here. He said he didn't want his ex-wife getting her hands on that silver. Tabish owes the IRS $300,000. He's hoping his new friend can help him with his money problems. And then there's Sandy. One thing led to another, they became friends. Rick started doing work for Teddy. That's how they came about, and that's how Sandy met Rick. It was through Ted. And because of the abuse that she was undergoing and suffering in the household, because of the drug addiction, because of the alcohol, she turned to Rick. And that's understandable in a house where there's abuse. And then a person turns to a caregiver for assistance. And that's what happened here with Sandy. I swear we only slept together twice. And we were pretty drunk. And we decided to break it off. Me married, two kids. Sandy with Ted. She was afraid of him. That he'd kill her if he ever found out. We thought we'd be together one day, but for now, just call it quits. I loved my man very much. And he was on heroin, and his love became heroin. And as a result, he had a friend who I trusted, who I confided in, and I took it a little too far on one occasion on September 13th. And because of that, I've been held accountable and to a, a standard that I don't think that any woman could live up to. Rick is deep in debt and desperate. Sandy is abused, alone, and about to get kicked out of her million dollar home. Not to mention that Ted might shoot them if he knew about their affair. Did Rick and Sandy murder Ted Binion? Ted was more valuable to them uh, dead than alive. Sandy felt she would inherit uh, the home and a certain amount of cash from Ted. and. Um, Tabish was basically trying to get at his wealth any way he could. And if Ted wasn't around, it would have been a lot easier. 
Now it's up to forensic science to prove their guilt or innocence. Casino boss Ted Binion died of a massive drug overdose. But was it murder? Dr. Ellen Clark is a forensic pathologist in Reno, Nevada. She believes Ted Binion was murdered. Mr. Binion had some uh, paleness and distortion or bending of the tip of his nose uh, toward the, uh, I believe it was the right side of the front of his face. In addition to this, he had evidence of skin break injury or abrasion on the sides of his upper lip, immediately below his nose. The total patterning all suggested that the body had at one point been uh, partially face down, and at the scene, uh, it was discovered face up, with these fixed changes suggesting that it remained face down for some time after death occurred, then had been rotated face up. If Sandy and Rick did kill Ted Binion, how did they do it? How do you force an addict to smoke heroin? Famed forensic pathologist Cyril Wecht thinks the idea is preposterous. Ted Binion bought the black tar. Ted Binion got the Xanax tablets from his next door neighbor. So you've got that short period of time. Think, so Sandy Murphy and Tavish you know, I'm not making them out to be imbeciles, but you know, they're not, uh, they're not medical people, they're not forensic scientists. They figure out, they conspire that, gee, he got the uh, black tar and he got the Xanax, this is what we can do. In, in, in less than two days, they planned the whole thing. Think about that. No matter, two days after Ted Binion's death, Rick Tabish is caught digging up the $5 million worth of silver he buried for the casino boss. What are you doing out here? Oh, I'm just cleaning up the place. I work at nights, just get ahead of the job. You know. What's in the truck? Oh, nothing. See? Nothing in there. Jimmy, come on up now. Steel on the bottom here. Uh-huh. Great night, isn't it? Yeah, a little nippy. You're digging holes in the middle of the night. Oh, yeah. Kind of do that now and then. Fill the holes in, you know. Uh -huh. Gravel taken out. What do you got? You better have a look at this. Is there is something in the truck. All right. I'm lying. I'm digging up the silver for Teddy Binion. I'm taking her to Las Vegas to put in a trust fund for Teddy's daughter for when she turns 35. Hey, I got, I got nothing to hide. Down, huh? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right, see, officer, I've got nothing to hide. Yeah, I'm sure you don't. The cops but don't buy it. He is arrested. Right. Police find a briefcase containing information for selling antique coins. The case also contains a love letter from Sandy Murphy. Okay, let's go over it again, Rick. I mean, I'd have to be a complete fool to come out and load a trailer full of silver. I even called you guys and told you I was coming out. I didn't come out here to, to rip the guy off. I mean, I have a year and a half year old kid, and a three and a half year old kid. You think I want to go to jail? Leave them without a daddy? 
I know it's hard for you to believe. <laughs> Rick is set free on bail. The state of Nevada reopens the Binion murder case. They're looking for new evidence to prove that Sandy Murphy and Rick Tabish killed the casino boss. Binion's gardener gives them what they're looking for. When I arrived at Ted's house, it was approximately 9 o'clock in the morning because I had checked the clock on my dash. The first thing I noticed was Sandy's car parked on the side. Uh, Sandy never parks her car on the side. It's always parked either in the garage or in a circular driveway in front of the house. So that seemed a little strange to me, but I didn't think too much of it. When I turned, I looked up, and that's when I noticed these curtains were closed. Those curtains were never supposed to be closed because Ted always told me those curtains have to be open because when he leaves his bedroom to walk into his den, he always wants to see them in the backyard. I thought, well, this doesn't look right, so I decided to check the house. Then Loveday notices something. A chair off the bathroom window. Did Ted kick Sandy out? And did she break in to kill him? Tom Loveday is certain. Sandy Murphy was in the house while he was in the yard, exactly when forensic science had determined <laughs> Ted Binion's time of death. Was Rick in the house too? Tabish and Ted Binion had become fast friends. But Rick couldn't take his eyes off Sandy. I'm not perfect, by all means. I made my mistakes. Some of the greatest lessons in life are about hardship. You don't learn that until your hands are slapped. They would go to uh, Pash Beverly Hills hotels and on weekends and rendezvous there and, and, uh, and live it up all behind Ted's back. And so it's a relationship that kind of evolved and last, uh, uh, over time, maybe the last four months of, of uh, Benny's life and where it became really serious at about the time that he was, uh, that he died. Investigators seek evidence to prove that Rick Tabish was in the house when Ted Binion died. Their main clue is Sandy's car. Tom Loveday had never seen it parked clear of the drive. I figured there was another car in, in her garage space. Because the other garage space, there is no way you could get in, because I'm parked in front of it. So who's ever in there cannot leave anyway. Ted Binion stashed millions of dollars all over his house. But police find safes and hiding spots empty. Did Sandy keep the driveway clear while Rick stole millions in cash? Lawyer John Mommett says the theory is crazy. Well, that's exactly correct, because you have a couple of things here. Number one, during the course of the trial, no one ever placed Sandy Murphy at the scene where the silver is being dug up. And at the trial, no one's ever placed Mr. Tabish in the house where Ted Binion's body was found that day. So we have a divergence of, uh, of facts here that's putting the people in opposite ends of the spectrum. Hi, Mary, it's Sandy. But there is another strange fact. I'm fine, thank you. You don't need to come in today. Ted isn't feeling very well. He was up all night, so was I, so we need to get some sleep, OK? Sandy Murphy canceled the cleaning lady the morning Ted I'll, Binion uh, died. I'll call you when he's feeling better. Thank you. Bye-bye now. But what about the gardener? Did smart Sandy simply forget to call him? 
Even if Rick Tabish was in the house, how could he kill Ted Binion? And can you get heroin in your stomach if you smoke it? Forensic scientist Ellen Clark says yes. Certainly you can uh, swallow heroin when you smoke it. It's going through the oral cavity, through the nasal cavity, so it may end up in the stomach. In Mr. Binion's case, the uh, morphine, the alprazolam in particular, and even the benzodiazepine, valium-like drugs, were all present in, in toxic and published lethal levels. Murder by deliberate overdose, a near-perfect crime. I'm an overachiever. She listened to my father. He told me all the time, learn to walk before you learn to run, Rick. I never listened. Got in too deep. But even if his life was being threatened, would Ted Binion deliberately overdose? Pathologist Cyril Wecht cannot envision the crime scene. And to my knowledge, nobody ever suggested that they had a gun pointed at his head. And even if you uh, restrain his wrist, uh, how do you uh, get this stuff uh, into him, including all of these Xanax tablets? The only other piece of evidence is the chair outside the back window. Vegas CSI Mike Perkins revisited the crime scene and took a closer look at the chair. We did fingerprint processing on the window, both inside and out, as well as the chair and the uh, windowsill inside. We did recover several prints from those areas. At a later time, these prints uh, became identified back to uh, Sandra Murphy. Did Sandy Murphy break into her own house to kill Ted Binion? It's a slim case, but Sandy Murphy and Rick Tabish are arrested for his murder. Court documents just released point to Murphy and her alleged boyfriend Rick Tabish as the masterminds of a conspiracy to kill a casino executive and take his assets. There isn't a week that goes by where we don't acquire more information. The investigation is not over with. Uh, we will continue to investigate uh, even up until the time the case goes to the jury. It's up to the jury to find the truth in one of Las Vegas's murkiest murders. This court is now in session. One and a half years after the death of Ted Binion, the trial of Sandy Murphy and Rick Tabish begins. Please be seated. Mob attorney John Momet defends Sandy Murphy as she and Tabish sit side by side and face a media frenzy. This young lady is strong and she's going to continue to fight because she's vindicated. But a long trial is no excuse for an expert witness to break the rules, is it? I do the best I can. Excuse me. And the gentlemen of the jury will then be the ultimate determiners of reasonableness. This is a case that really captivated Las Vegas. I mean, the, the first trial was shown live gavel to gavel on, on television. Uh, it was also covered live by Court TV. In this case paints a clear picture of two people who killed a man. It's just a case that fascinated everybody. It was this ultimate mystery. There was no smoking gun. There was a compelling circumstantial case, but no one could really say for sure how Ted Binion died. And I think that was part of what uh, piqued everybody's interest. Go ahead, Teddy. The prosecution maintains that Binion's overdose was forced on him by Rick and Sandy. Come on, pick it up. Pick it up. Go ahead. Cyril Wecht testified for the defense Go again. And he thinks the lovers didn't stand a chance. I don't care what anybody says when a jury is convened in a criminal case, especially a homicide case, those jurors, the overwhelming majority of them, 
will go in thinking, hey, this guy would not be here charged with murder if they did not have a case. Anytime you have adultery or cheating on the side, then that's going to be a major factor in the consideration of the jury, even though it does not directly have relevance and application of the true issues in the case. Another forensic pathologist presents the jury with a new and radical theory. I think they had one primary witness. His name was Dr. Michael Bodden. Dr. Michael Bodden is a forensic superstar. They didn't want to be influenced by outside opinion. His theory makes a messy legal case even messier. My opinion is he died of asphyxia by suffocation. The process is known as burking, named after a famous Scottish serial killer who suffocated his victims by sitting on their chests. Why is he shaking? Shh, it's okay. Daddy's done. Some pathologists including yourself, have described suffocation as perhaps the perfect crime. I would not say perfect crime. It's the most difficult, it's among the most difficult diagnoses to make at autopsy. Baden says the mark on Binion's chest is from one of his shirt buttons. Baden's expertise hits home with the jury. But there is another twist. And the opinions that you reached in this case were opinions that you Shell reached. went on to portray Baden as a gun for hire, pointing out he was initially hired by the Binion family, not the prosecution. The opinions I reached were the opinions I reached the day before I testified in the preliminary hearing. And at that time, at that time, I had come out here at the request of the family, yes. Then it is pathologist Cyril Weck's turn. He totally disagrees with Baden. I, I just don't find a basis for such a diagnosis in this case. Take the morphine, and you take the Xanax, and you take the Valium, and you got three drugs that are depressing the brain, and you have a synergistic effect. And you have Wecht also asks, what on earth do Sandy and Rick know about burking? Boy, if you know, you sit on the chest and I'll cover the nose and I'll cover the mouth and we'll stop him from breathing and so on and so forth. You know. And by the way, there was no evidence of strangulation and no marks on the neck or in the soft tissues beneath the skin in the neck and so on. You know, again, uh, 99 out of 100 doctors don't know what burking is and 95 out of 100 pathologists who don't do forensic pathology know what burking is and 999, no, 999 1,999 out of a million forensic pathologists had never used burking as a diagnosis. I'm still looking for the last case that was signed out as burking anywhere in the world. Wecht says Ted's scraped lip is shaving burn, plain and simple. My opinion that this case represented homicide was based upon the fact that collective evidence, that is the physical evidence on the body, coupled with the investigative evidence, many inconsistencies at the scene and in the follow-up investigations indicated that other people may have had a hand in Mr. Bingham's death. In other words, Ellen thinks Rick and Sandy killed Ted. Wecht doesn't. You're going to have six, eight, ten forensic scientists, as in the Binion case, top people, forensic pathologists, toxicologists, etc. And but these 12 jurors, most of whom who didn't go to college, most of whom never even saw a chemistry physics lab, let alone looked under a microscope or saw a dead body and dissected it, but they will figure it out. They'll figure it out. It's ridiculous. Less than two months after the trial began, the jurors returned with their verdict. We, the jury in the above entitled case, find the defendant, Richard Bennett Tabish, as follows. Count seven, murder with use of a deadly weapon. 
guilty of murder of the first degree. We, the jury in the above entitled case, find the defendant, Sandra Renee Murphy, as follows. Count seven, murder with use of a deadly weapon. Guilty of murder of the first degree. I can remember, but I don't know that I could ever describe it. Because at the same time, I was disheartened to think that anybody who ever knew us as a couple would ever think that I would harm someone that I loved. They each get 20 years. But there has been a major legal screw up. One that will open up old wounds and set Sandy Murphy free. California surfer girl Sandy Murphy finds herself doing hard time, convicted of a murder she says she did not commit. I went to prison for four and a half years. The first six months I did in solitary confinement. I received a 30 minute phone call in the morning in a shower, escorted back to my cell, and a 30 minute phone call in a shower later on that evening, Monday through Friday, Locked down Friday till Monday for my first six months. And then I was eventually sent to the Women's State Penitentiary in Nevada. It's not about passing or failing. Alan Dershowitz is among the most famous defense lawyers in the world. He defends underdogs. And he believes Sandy Murphy and Rick Tabish were wrongfully convicted. I love Teddy with all my heart. And I know he loved me just as much. I'm sorry for the day I walked out that door on September 17th and left him there alone. I'm sorry for not being there when he needed me the most. I absolutely and unequivocally did not kill Ted Binion. Digging up the silver was the worst decision of my life. I got sucked into Ted Binion's world. Dershowitz says the Binion case is unique because prosecutors presented two forensic stories. Maybe Binion was suffocated, or maybe he was forced to overdose. You can't have it both ways. Yeah, 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 take Sandy out of the will. If she doesn't kill me tonight. Then there's the testimony from Ted Binion's lawyer. Total hearsay from a dead man. Well, if I end up dead, you'll know what happens. In October 2004, Sandy Murphy and Rick Tabish get a retrial and a second chance. Well, I think that the truth spoke for itself in my second trial, and I was vindicated for all the right reasons, thanks to medical science. And I think that it was easy to pick out an indiscretion that sort of became the catalyst to my downfall. And ultimately it was rectified. And we are where we are today. But sure, my involvement with Rick Tabish was the catalyst. It was the beginning of the end. And um, I'm grateful for science because that's what led me to where we are today and to my newfound freedom. Ms. Murphy, I'd like you to stand up and face the jury. We, the jury, in the above entitled case, find the defendant, Richard Bennett Tabish, as follows. Count one, conspiracy to commit murder and or robbery. We find the defendant not guilty. We, the jury, in the above entitled case, find the defendant, Sandra Renee Murphy, as follows. Count one, conspiracy to commit murder and or robbery. We find the defendant not guilty. Both are found not guilty of murder, but guilty of stealing Ted Binion's money. Sandy Murphy is appealing that decision. Today, after four and a half years of hard time, Sandy Murphy is free. I feel relief that I have set the record straight that I've been given a second chance. Sandy Murphy is free, clear from the legal shadow of Ted Binion's death. So even though at some point 
every now and then I feel a little resentful. I'm grateful at the same respect that they gave me a greater sense of self and I was able to achieve what I did. And I don't know that I ever thought that I would be capable of fighting and surviving through all of this, knowing who I was at such a young age at Teddy's death in comparison to the woman I am now. Rick Tabish is up for parole in 2008. Did they do it? Unless one of them confesses, no one will ever know for sure. <laughs>